So we will begin now with the panel questions. Um, we're going to start first with a, a trying to get an understanding of the U.S. market. So we will begin with Malene. Uh, as a huge market, should our marketing efforts be focused on regions or even cities? What cities in the USA would be looking would you would look at to sell some of the jewelry that's represented here? Well, as we know, the U.S. is the largest jewelry market in the world. It's worth about sixty billion. But I, I understand that all of you are in the luxury market. Am I correct? Yes. So the, in the luxury market, uh, it's usually the metro cities that you, you know, that you can get critical mass. So it's always uh, the coastal New York, California. Uh, the South Florida is also an immense market. And actually, because of where Neiman Marcus is, Texas happens to be a great state. So you need to choose you know, where uh, you, you find the opportunity and the engagement. So obviously, uh, I don't recommend you being in all these regions at the same time. It depends on your resources as well. So. Now, given that, is there a specific U.S. market for limited editions of one of a kind jury? Any specific cities? Again, you know, uh, all these markets have needs and, um, you know, they are rich people in all these markets. I mean, you'd be very surprised there was um, an Italian jeweler, Mattia Cello, who had a piece in the Rock Report, uh, and this was at Bergdorf Goodman. He's, he was only at Bergdorf Goodman. Someone from St. Louis <coughs> called up the Rock Report and purchased a $35,000 piece. So there are people everywhere. It's where you find, you know, where your customer is. You really need to know the market and know <coughs> find a, a place where you know people can see your work in that particular market. So it doesn't matter where, whether you start in Miami or in LA or New York. So you know, start somewhere and give it a chance to, uh, for people to be aware, to, to know who you are. And uh, Karen, I, I know that SC DuPont has um, limited edition pieces as well as part of their full collection. Can you tell us a little bit more about that in the US markets? Absolutely. Um, Onto what Mei Ling had, had said, there, there's always a market for one of a kind limited edition pieces. Uh, the company that I work for, SD DuPont, we just launched, well, this year's the Year of the Dragon, which in Asian culture, it's it's the most important year in the astrological you know, signs. And so our Asian markets in particular, um, I mean, we completely sold through and sold out of our limited edition one of a kind dragon line. So it, I think it also, depends on the particular theme and the, the kind of limited edition piece that that uh, that you're working with as well. So if I can add, in um, the gallery market for what we call here craft jewelry, but it, even if it's both craft, if it's expensive and one of a kind, the craft market is shore to shore, and where you find the best galleries are where there are pockets of money. So besides the coasts, as Melia said, you'd find them in resort areas. Mm -hmm. So we've got some of the best outlets for your work would be in Aspen or Telluride mm -hmm. or um, some of the beach towns mm -hmm. as well. And the craft world really works differently than the fine jewelry world. They, they're concentric circles. They are, there's few people that overlap. There's some stores that call themselves galleries that are really retail jewelry stores and vice versa. So you know, looking for your peer group is more important than picking a city and saying, I want to be in that city. So having said that then, um, is it possible for an artist to only show his work in U.S. galleries or small boutiques rather than in large department stores? And is this a profitable strategy? A profitable is a whole other story. <laughs> That's a lot different than where you could be. Um, yes, galleries are a different world than the department stores. And department stores have a very have their own philosophy of how to buy, which I'm sure you can all speak to very differently than a craft gallery. Um, both are consignment or memo, whichever word you use, um, just depends what, whose deal you like better and which right. way they want to, they work. It's about finding good business partners, whichever size store, but usually department stores, you also need quite a lot of merchandise to work with them. Right. So well, I've yet to meet a designer that doesn't want to sell in Bergdorf, so doesn't think they're perfectly right mm -hmm. for Bergdorf's, 
clearly Bergdorf doesn't agree. <laughs> right. I, I also yeah. recommend that uh, it's better to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond in the beginning. Go to a B market first. You know, don't look to Beverly Hills and New York first. Uh, unless you have the resources to support you, if you one of you come to me, you know what I have a backer with ten or fifteen million. How do I write a business plan, you know, for my business? Most of us, you know, are smaller jewelers, and you want to create awareness in a small market, and then so that Randy and Victoria can write about you. <laughs> and, and I would just like to say that I would um, always recommend that you focus on the smaller accounts because they're going to be the backbone of your business. Everyone wants to be in the larger stores, but the, the larger store should only be the icing on the cake. You should have your, your stable, the people that are really going to be true to you um, each time. They're, it's not going to be looked at as a trend or the right moment to be in one of these. You know, it's it's very prestigious to be in the Bergdorf's or the Neiman's, but they could really hurt your business in the end if you're not able to support it in the way that they want to see it supported. So focus on that smaller customer and really make that the, the backbone of your business and really be there for them and they will be there for you. So Teresa, now let me ask you this other question. Um, the economic situation with respect to one of a kind jury, how have you seen it with your accounts? One of a kind jewelry is a little bit more difficult for us as a multi line showroom. We do have a few designers that have one of a kind. What we have to always make sure is that they have a really full representation so that every time we get another account into the showroom, we're able to always showcase the work to the best advantage. But you can really grow all of the businesses that you have for one of a kind. You just have to really be there to support them and really uh, you know, provide them with you know, consistently new and, and really be able to provide the service that you need to. It's really, I'm, I'm going to be going off of what <laughs> we're talking about, but to, you know, to, to be there and supporting them and go and visit the stores and you know, meet their clients and really develop the relationship because that's, it, it's, it's everything in this business. Can I just say something about small accounts? It's extremely important. You know, the first time I worked with a gallery in Boise, Idaho, um, and I was going out there to do a session with them of where they had had clients coming in to meet me to do special designs, people were saying, you're going to Boise, but I'm going to tell you something. They were the only game in town. They spent X amount of years building up their reputation, and people came to that gallery because they believed in them and they believed that what they were offering was what nobody else in town could give them. So don't discount the small stores because that's where, and like you said, to have that um, relationship, because if you do for them, they'll know that the next time a client comes in looking for something, they're going to think, oh, you know what, maybe she can do it or maybe he can do it. And they'll contact you, and then you just keep building on that. So really, really important. So that's my two cents. Um, in, in developing a collection, how do you? How, what's the best way to select, select pieces for the portfolio when you're making a pitch to a gallery, individual, or retailer? And uh, I guess we can examine it for from three different levels, to retailer, the showroom rep, and an editor. What's the best way to pick pieces? So, we'll start with you, Victoria. <laughs> Well, I'll preface this by saying JCK recently did uh, a survey, a jewelry survey of luxury consumers with, uh, we partnered with W Magazine, which is a high-end fashion publication, and the findings were pretty remarkable. They, one of the chief findings was that the market had bifurcated. Pretty much it was one of a kind, high-end, money's there if it's a unique special piece, and then low-end and very low-end. The middle has largely disappeared in the last few years. Um, what we found was that luxury consumers really wanted, they, they were willing to spend the money and pay a premium for high-end pieces, but they wanted a story. They really liked storytelling. And so uh, one of the things I think about when you're putting together a collection is one that is coherent, is cohesive. Uh, you know, there's a through line that connects, you know, all the pieces to the designer, to, to what they're saying. And so, and have that be a part of, you know, we might get to the marketing later, but that kind of storytelling ability that a retailer can say to their best customer, oh, this is a great designer, they're from Quebec, you know, they started out, you know, 
whatever the story is, but they want to be able to share that because that's the kind of thing a luxury consumer will, you know, her friends will compliment her on her ring and she says, oh, guess what? This is whatever that story is. And so think how, about. How important are precious gems and gold and. Um, good, what, what, one of the things we're finding is that design trumps preciousness. You know, if there's a, a, a concept and a, a strong craftsmanship element to it, it's not as important. There were a lot of people who, gold is, 18 karat is, you know, a, a very, a winning metal and a winning material at the moment, but plenty of high-end customers are buying costume pieces that they mix with their finds. So you'll see an armful of bangles, half of them will be resin or lucite or whatever they are, and then the other half will be 18 karat and platinum. And that customer doesn't mind that mix. They What they really appreciate is the aesthetic and the design. And so I think uh, craftsmanship and just a high-end kind of sensibility trumps whether or not that material is you know, historically precious. But, you know, which isn't to underpin, people still love gold. Um, Ling, do, do you want to add to that? Um, I, I encourage you to take a walk uh, to Bergdorf Goodman, if you have time, because you find that none of the people in those cases are really big brands. There are very few big brands. That they're people like yourselves. In fact, they only are in one store or two stores. There's a new designer called Wilfredo Rosado, and um, he uses gold with diamonds, but he also has feathers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen him, but when they they look at the designs, it, they're one of a kind, and Bergdorf knows their customer really well. They're not there to buy so many grams of gold or silver. They're there to buy something that you know they've never seen before. It's about discovery. So they like to bring in you know people like yourselves when it's because they know their customer really well. If you're right for them, you know their customers continue to want to discover. They're not looking for a David Yerman, my alma mater, because you know it's like Tiffany. They might they might get that as a gift for someone, but for the, to adorn themselves, like what Victoria was saying, it, it doesn't matter if it's thirty thousand and it's made of titanium, mm -hmm. or it's two thousand and it's made of lucite. So it's all about design, and uh, um, you know when when they wear it to the, the gala, you know it's. It's a conversation piece. Mm -hmm. It's not something. It's not about oh, you know, you've got, you know, the recognition when you wear a Cartier and everybody sees oh, she's arrived. Mm -hmm. And I think I think these customers, the one of a kind, is above that already. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And Teresa, too. How would you um, go about advising your? Well, what happens in the showroom? Um, I. I'm able to see a lot of the designers when they're first um, looking for a showroom. So I, I try to view everything um, before the, our COO and the um, chief um, financial <coughs> officer look at everything. And I really look to have a very cohesive collection and I also want it to have a point of view. I want it to have an identity. And that could be from if you were a, a fashion jewelry designer and you're using um, non-precious elements, but it, it, or you're doing something precious, but it always has a point of view, it has an identity, and it, and it tells a story, like Victoria said, that you, there's, there's something to talk about, and you can, the designers that are most successful are designers that it, it's very recognizable as their own piece, and yes, every collection's may, perhaps going to look different, but there's a core element, and that's the sign for us that this is a designer that we could really grow with, because we see they have a point of view, and they're going to you know, continue to showcase that, even if their designs change, but there's, there's an element that um, is, is very appealing when, it, when it's, it's cohesive, and it's, it's well assorted, and it has the brand identity. Randy, I'm going to direct this question to you just because of your, your books. Um, what do you think are the most appealing designs in jewelry? Uh, are they guided by fall fashion predictions from Pantone and choosing colored stones? You know, I, I actually just recently wrote a story where I talked just to retailers um, about how they choose new designers for their stores, which I think is very um, appropriate for what we're talking about here. And most of them, you know, said that it's not really dictated by that so much, although it might help you a little bit if someone, if on, from an editorial basis, if 
this year's color is tangerine, tango, and you have some pieces that fit into that, it might help you get some editorial because people will probably be doing some spreads that have those types of pieces. But most, for the most part, it's more about you know what, what everyone's been talking about here in terms of following your identity, following your DNA, and being true to that. Um, and because the, even the most successful designers that I speak to um, don't really follow fashion trends. They follow their instincts and what they're seeing. So I think that's important. But I will say from a retailer's perspective, uh, if you are looking to approach not a bird or equipment, but um, a retailer, uh, a smaller retailer, um, and if they're looking to invest in a collection, almost every single one of them told me that they need to have enough of a range, enough of a collection, that they can, customers in their store need to see that. They need to see a, a grouping of pieces, not just one or two, um, to really understand it and to really kind of get behind it, fall in love with it. So they're always looking for, you know, at least, you know, six to ten pieces of that collection that they can invest in. So if they can't invest in that as a, as a story, then they're not going to be able to really sell it properly to their customers. Um, so they, every single one of them said um, you know, that they really feel like to, to find a new designer, they need to be able to make an investment in their collection, not just a piece or two, because it won't work in their store. Um, so I think that's something to consider when you are approaching people with, um, with the collection um, that you haven't worked with before. They need to cherry pick from your collection what works for them. Yes, for so if you have enough of an assortment, they will buy more naturally. If there's 12 to choose from, the natural human instinct is to cherry pick, well, I'll just take three earrings if there's 12 choices. If there's nine choices, I might take one earring. Um, every buyer knows what's right for their customer. So they're gonna approach your line and immediately start cherry picking for their audience. Whether they're right or wrong from your perspective, they know, they know their customer. So the more you have for them to choose from, the more they can buy. So a wide assortment means earrings that are small, medium, and large. Even though as an artist, you probably hate thinking that way. But as a good merchandiser, you want big bangles and small bangles. You want rings that women who have trouble with their knuckles can wear, as well as women who are built large and built petite. If you assort your line, take your artistic vision and interpret it for every language, they can buy more. That's how you sell more. Is it a good idea then to develop lower cost original products from our high hand pieces? Or does this look cheap? I'm going to extend that to Karen. Um, because I know that you have the Defeat Collection. You introduced the Defeat Collection um, as a lower end line to get the younger market. So do you want to talk a little bit about that in regards to this question? Sure. We, um Essie Dupont is, is a very, if you're not familiar with that brand, um, we produce and we manufacture uh, very, very high-end men's accessories and also ready-to-wear. We're probably most famous for our lighters. We really have no competitors because we make the world's most expensive lighters. Now, nowadays, you know, after what happened in 2008, we're very much conscious of price positioning. And we launched a entry price point line, which starts a few hundred dollars anywhere from three to five hundred and that collection has been uh, it's been selling the most more so than our high-end line um, it's again I think in this market in this economy everyone is very it's their price conscious so um, I, I like to add that I, I've had a couple of meetings uh, with retailers Neiman's and Sachs they've told me that the their business above 50,000 at retail is very very good and then the, but the, and the business below 5,000 yeah, or 2,000 actually is very, very good. So anything in the middle is uh, where the aspirational customers still isn't back yet. Mm -hmm. So the 1% the that we're talking about is really spending money. I mean, their business, the comp mm -hmm. business, I think Victoria is very, very positive. Mm -hmm. Even in, uh, I don't know about the election year, how it would affect the US market. But um, so you either go very high end and like uh, Teresa said, really position yourself that way because you cannot be all things to all people. You know, you have to decide who you want to be and then stay there. You, and you may not be at the stage, you know, where you are making, you know, $20,000 pieces to say that you make $200 pieces as well. So decide who you are 
because otherwise, if you're schizophrenic, then the, st the retailer won't know who you are either. Yeah, and to add Makes to that, I, I just, um, I actually just spoke with Janet Goldman fragments for a story that I was <laughs> writing for Victoria, so this panel <laughs> for JCK, um, about costume, fine costume jewelry, right. and how strong that market is right now. And Janet was also very effusive about uh, that marketplace and how it can mix extremely well with high end, um, and that it's it's just very strong right now. So if you, you know, if that's a way that you could go, you could interpret your jewelry in that way, which some people do find costumes still use actual gemstones. Um, they might use brass, or you know, they might. You're a good example of exactly <laughs> this uh, this particular stuff. Um, like, yeah, but the fine on. But yeah, <laughs> so a mix. But it's it's a very very strong market right now, and people. It's it's kind of amazing actually that there's um, stores that are really doing both and doing both extremely well. Obviously, department stores do um, because they have different floors, different sections. Um, you know, where they have fine in one place, um, like a Barney's will have fine on the first floor and then have a, a co-op floor that has, uh, has costume. It's still, you know, not cheap jewelry. It could be, up, you know, up to $2,000 in the, in the costume sections. Um, but then there's, so, there's also um, plenty of retailers actually now, uh, fine jewelry retailers that are dabbling in that market a bit more, although some have a hard time um, Going that way, it feels it feels a little weird to them still um, to put that in their store alongside fine. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's so accessible to find that jewelry now, whether it's online, whether it's even in a J. Crew or a Banana Republic that's putting out these really cool pieces. Mm -hmm. If you don't, they're finding that if they don't offer that to their customers, that they'll find it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very strong market right now. If that's something that you're interested in, but they're looking for kind of big statement pieces, which is great from what I saw over gallery, it's exactly what they're looking for in that market. A huge look that you might not be able to afford and find, so people are looking for it in costume. Um, next question, uh, do galleries and retailers prefer to work directly with artists, or do they prefer dealing with sales reps, Teresa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, um, I, I would say that quite often the department stores and the stores prefer to work with sales reps because they can be very honest. It's very, very, very hard um, if they don't feel um, strongly about a designer's look <coughs> or something that they've done to, to say that to the actual artist. They know that artists are, are certainly a lot more sensitive than a, than a sales rep. They could be very open and it's certainly advantageous for, for me to always be as open to the retailer um, because I, I have to develop that relationship. I have to be true to the retailer and I have to also be true to the designer. So I, I have always made sure that I'm, I'm honest and when I'm talking about a particular design, I want to tell them exactly how it's selling. I want to be upfront. I want to support the artist, but I also want to support the retailer. They're very, very, I mean, they're the, the of course, the designer is the backbone of the business and the retailer is the backbone. So it, it's, it's, it's very important to have that connection. And I think that they know this. They know that we're in there together with them and we're going to support them in every way they can. So I, I do feel that they prefer to work with the sales rep so they can have that open communication. There's always, um, they love to meet the designer, they love to hear the, the viewpoint, to hear where the inspiration comes, to have that in their own, to hear it in, from the artist directly is, is immense. Well, you know, it's, it's so important to, you, to the, the ultimate customer because they'll pass that on to, to the consumer as well. So how do you recognize a good sales rep? What questions should they be asking him? What characteristics should they be looking for? Well, I think that you definitely, if you're going with an individual sales rep, you should see who else they're working with. Perhaps you want to have someone that has a couple of uh, designers so that you're in the same area so that when they're going to make a sales call, it's very natural that they would have the, the relationships already um, with the stores based on the designers, you, you want to have someone that you would sit next to in a store and that would give you certainly more opportunity and you know that the sales rep has the relationships. 
it's, again, I can't stress enough that relationships are key in this industry. I mean, it's a very um, close-knit community, and it's, it's very important to, to have the relationship to get your foot in the door. And, um, and having someone who's already working with the retailers that you would like to be in is, is what I would look for first. And they're very hard to find, though. We really don't want to give the impression that there are just armies of reps to be found. It's very, very challenging. And, um, you know, it's, it's dangerous for them. It's a hard business for them. And most people want to pay for fish, and they don't really like paying people to go fishing for them. So for the rep, they still have to eat in between your sales, and they don't want to just work on commission. And that's usually the dichotomy between a small company and a salesman. Do you want to elaborate on the payment structures that's present in a, in a sales relationship? Yeah, you know, a, a sales rep should be getting a, a salary plus commission. Um, I just spoke with someone the other day who <coughs> has been in this business for years, and he said a good base salary is 50000 plus commission, 10% commission, and expenses billed back to you. So that's a big chunk for you to think of to have someone working for you. It's a good chunk. It's a good chunk. But Teresa, do you want to elaborate more on that as well? Uh, I, would, I would want to just elaborate about the, the structure for a showroom. Um, we have definitely different, very different contracts for yeah. um, all the different designers that we represent because there's a different structure for fashion jewelry than it would be for fine jewelry. They're certainly working on different um, markups, so we would take everything into consideration. But the general rule is that there's a monthly showroom fee, so that would be, you know, as you're paying rent for where you live, you're paying rent where your jewelry lives lives and of, of course you um, are you know going to be able to have people see your collection at all times because you are you're based in a city where buyers continually come not just for markets but for various reasons as well um, and then there's the commission that is on top of that so you have your monthly showroom fee and then you have a commission structure and that's again based on um, the type of jewelry that you you do. Is there a range, Teresa? Um, I would Just say that the range with the commission schedule would probably be from 10 to 15 percent. And I would say the showroom fee could be anywhere, it would depend on the space that you would have, and that would go anywhere from 200 to 600 a month. And you also get to see editors when you're in the showroom. Uh, too, absolutely, really absolutely. We do have yeah. a separate we do have a separate contract for PR as well. If you would get automatically the general um, PR activity, which is immense because stylists and editors and just everyone from the the press world is in the showroom at all times. They're getting to see a lot in one visit, so they're continuously coming in to make sure that they're kept abreast of everything, and at the same time be able to borrow um, merchandise for their photo shoots. Um, and then there's a more in-depth um, contract where you can get desk side um, interviews with all of the editors and, and really have um, structure into your doing the press kit and to doing uh, you know any kind of advertising and promotional activities. So as our artists are working to find a, a, show, a sales rep or a showroom to work with them, um, how can they, I guess on their own, uh, pursue getting to galleries or small boutiques? What would you recommend be the first step? Should it be uh, um, present themselves personally? Should they send an email? Should they send a letter? What is a good starting point? To, to get some attention from retailers? I would introduce myself via email with a lookbook of your most important work. Don't send 20 pages, you know, choose three pieces that are iconic and important that stands for who you are. And if they love those, then they'll say, you know, send me more or when can we meet? Because they get a lot of phone calls, obviously. I think the first approach is email uh, and then follow that with another email or a phone call and I would say grow a thick skin mm -hmm. because <laughs> squeaky wheel you know gets the oil it doesn't hurt to they might say oh, he's calling me again but she may actually pick up the phone and say 
what do you want? And you get, you know, don't, don't take it personally, which is why sometimes it's easier. I know some of you have a partner that they can do that instead of you because it's like they're rejecting you. You're the, you created this. It's like someone saying something about your child. But keep at it if that's mm -hmm. the right retailer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of them are very open to receiving emails because they need to find the next star. So, and it might be one, you know, very well be one of you. So, so then Cindy, talk to us about trade shows as an avenue to meet the retailers. Well, since I own one and work for others, I'm obviously a big fan of trade shows. There are really only two ways to sell, right? You stand in one place and have them come to you, a trade show, or you hit the road and go to them. That's the only way to build the relationship. So it's cost effective to be in a show. It, you get the chance to meet not only the buyers, but press, other industry VIPs, your peers. You know, what you learn from each other is, could be almost as valuable as an order you'd get at a show. So I'm really, I'm really positive about shows work, especially when you consider them as a marketing expense, not a sales expense. You have to see the bigger picture about a trade show and not head off to a show knowing you've got a mortgage payment coming up and you need that show's orders to cover that. That's the sure sign of failure. Shows traditionally could take three, um, three times to get the feel of that this is the right market for you. There's a lot of different markets. So you need to have a little bit of patience and you need to be very open to who you'd meet, how you, what friends and business friends you'd make. You never know when another designer is going to bring a retailer over to you, when an editor is going to visit and go, oh my god, on the coffee line a minute ago, I was just talking to a retailer who said they were looking for something like you. It's a very holistic experience. There's a lot to get out of going to trade shows. Um, and here in America, we have a lot of different kinds of shows. Um, I, have, I have a chart for you later when I get to meet with you that shows you our landscape, and there's many, many opportunities. Please don't sign up for a show without talking to at least five other people. You need to understand the show that you're, you're coming into. We're a big country, we got a lot of stuff. You want to make sure it fits your stuff. But trade shows are an invaluable experience in my We have one more avenue here in the U.S. and that's online retailing. Um, I'm going to direct this to you, uh, Randy. If you could tell us a little bit more about the online retail world and what is the best way to get seen by an online retailer. <coughs> say there's uh, there's so many options right now it depends which avenue you kind of want to take um, jewelry I do I think it's a little tricky to be honest with you um, jewelry uh, I mean I know from my experience is, is a little bit of a harder sell online than um, especially finished jewelry so people are buying a lot of diamonds or you know that kind of basic jewelry online but when we're talking about more um, kind of creative fine jewelry it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Other, other accessory categories sell a lot better online. Um, and you have to know also that there's a pretty big return rate. So you have to think about who you're working with um, for online. Obviously, there's the avenue of the very kind of ubiquitous sample sales sites that are out there right now. Um, I will warn you that they take enormous commissions if you're talking about working with someone like a any of those, they take very big commissions um, and uh, expect you to knock at least 30% off of your retail price for them. Um, so it's it can be a great way to get your brand seen, but it is still remains to be seen if that um, if people are continuing to come back and buy again, or coming back to buy you not on sale. Um, that has not been proven at all yet, actually. So it might give you a good uh, it might get your name out there, but it might not actually make you any money. So a lot of people do it for marketing purposes, really only, and not so much to make money. Um, I know Ely maybe can speak to this as well. It's a tough it's a tough category, and if you aren't going that way, I will say um, rings are the hardest thing to sell online for sizing reasons. Um, it's very hard for people to know if things fit, so earrings actually usually sell the best, um, from my experience. Um, and the other thing I would say is people who are buying jewelry online, um, realistically, are looking, are usually want to get it right away. They need it for an occasion. Um, they're giving it as a gift for an anniversary. It's a husband buys something or it's something that they need right away. That's why they're shopping online. They don't have time to go out and look. 
So if you're um, if you're not able to have your merchandise available right away for shipping, um, it could be an issue. If, uh, sites might have a hard time working with you. Some sites um, say that there's a long wait time, but I find that most people who are shopping online, it's either an impulse purchase or it's for a gift and they need it right away. So if you're one of those people who needs six weeks, four to six weeks to make a piece, it might not be your best avenue. Um, although I will say there are um, a couple of sites that are happening right now that are interesting, like uh, the site called Edition 01, that does, they work with designers to do um, limited edition collections that are only available on their site. Um, so it's, they're kind of, there are people going towards this movement of, of their customers looking for curated pieces that are unique, that are, that you can't find anywhere else. And that could be a really great avenue for somebody. So if you search out sites like that, um, it's edition01.com, they are looking for those types of things. So there is that customer that's looking for the unique um, that you can't find at every store out there. But it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky market, um, yeah. online jewelry, because as you know, people like to try it on and they like to see how it feels and see how it wears. And um, there's opportunities, but it can be costly. Um, and you just might need a lot of merchandise ready to go. The, the other good site for luxury high-end jewelry and one of a kind is Moda Operandi. I think you've heard of it? No? Moda it's Operandi. Awesome. It, uh, they sell a lot of runway fashion and in between fashion shows they have to offer accessories. So jewelry is something they do. Um, I'll be happy to give you the name. They they appeal to a very sophisticated customer. So even non-branded, if it's an unknown brand, they, they love things like that. Uh, and Randy's right, usually with jewelry, you, you have, the most successful ones are the ones who are brands. You know, they, because people want to buy something they already know. So, um, so it's not really, you know, a, a huge opportunity. I think brick and mortar is still important. And in the craft world, there's artfulhome.com. They sell a lot of jewelry. And it's craft artisan made jewelry. So now, let's just say our artists have finally gotten into a retailer. We're happy. We're, we're in there. What do they need to know about what these retailers are going to expect from them? Um, you, if you are not a proven uh, brand or designer, you will probably be asked to give your jewelry to them. So in exchange for prime real estate, they'll say you, you have to consign your jewelry and they would give you probably at least a couple of seasons to, uh, actually broke off is a three month window. Someone like a Neiman Marcus or Sachs, they are much more forgiving and they give you a couple of seasons uh, to try to sell the merchandise and very often you would be there doing personal appearances or trunk shows, which is a good experience for you as well, to interact uh, on the floor with the salespeople and with the customer. And then you, I find that a lot of people find out exactly what the customer is looking for and they might, you know, tweak or uh, refinesse their jewelry to that particular region or market or this, oh, I didn't realize, you know, they really like the, the, the gold with some of the silver. Little things like that, um, but uh, very important. So if you're not used to it, that's the sad news, that you're expected to consign your jewelry. And I'm going to touch on that um, right now. What are your thoughts on that? Is there any way around it? What, what are the other options that will be available to them besides the consignment, if there is any? Uh, some independent stores are much better, like what Teresa talked about, the smaller stores, they they love, you know, like uh, you went to, is it Boise, Idaho? If you find a gallery or a store that loves your work and they don't carry you know, all the mass brands, they'll, they'll say, you know what, maybe we'll, we'll buy, you know, we'll take 20,000, we want you to give us another 20,000 to make the case look good, or we'll buy six pieces, and that's what that. There are a lot of these stores. In fact, some of them we all know. Do you know Ryan Ho, jewelers in Puerto Rico? She's one of the best supporters of uh, new young designers. She's based in Puerto Rico. I mean, when David Yerman, 30 years ago, was not a, a big brand, she was one of the first to carry. 
the line, uh, she actually created, you know, uh, discovered a lot of brands. She's one of the few in the industry mm -hmm. that I know of. Well, yeah. and it's also actually interesting because if you are going for the smaller stores, oftentimes they won't want to take a lot of people on consignment because if they've already have bought into a lot of collections, they don't want to take their cape space away from the things they've already purchased to give it to someone that's consigned. Um, because they've already spent money, so they want to be promoting that person. So a lot of times these kind of smaller um, designer boutique stores um, will will purchase. As I said, it, it, it just depends. They just want to make sure they have enough assortment for their um, for their uh, customer. But so there's a mix. There yes. are there are people who will who will buy. Because yeah, the, the smaller stores. Elsewhere. The smaller yeah. stores. They would invest in you, and they want you to invest with them, and not sell to the the jeweler down the street That's as exactly well. Yes. They want exclusivity, basically, mm -hmm. in their in their area. Right. And they may ask you to switch out merchandise, mm -hmm. even though they bought it. They say, "Well, it didn't work. Can you just take this and give me something else?" You know. So. And just because they all ask for consignment, because every one would, doesn't mean you have to give it. You know, you don't have to say yes. You can, it's always a negotiation, and if they want you enough, uh, there's, I've heard countless stories over the years of a gallery who's only consignment, they're only consignment, they're only consignment, except for so and so, who they love and who won't give them on consignment, so they pay for them. So you can, um, I think the best thing is to start off with a relationship model, and when they ask for consignment, you explain that it, you know how much you can afford. If it's a store that you're dying to be in, you probably can afford more than if it's a, if it's just any old store. Um, you make an arrangement and put a time limit on it. Not everybody does that when a store says we'd like to try you with consignment. Then you volley back with, well, you know, maybe for the first six months we can do that, and then let's see about you writing your first order within the six to twelve month mark. Make sure you put that in writing so you can always reference back this negotiation. Um, and then backing up an order with sales. You know, I can't afford to give consignment totally, but with an order of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, I'm sure I can fill in for you of a certain amount. But by using that language, you stay in control of, the con of your conversation and you don't have to feel, sometimes designers feel victimized. Everybody just wants my stuff for free. Well, it's a negotiation. They also need to be able to fill their store economically for their budget too. Yeah, and I, I think the real estate is very important. Real mm -hmm. estate, is, in fact, is sometimes more important than the, the money to, buy, to purchase. For a, a good store to give you, you know, a case line, they're giving, you know, they're giving you money in a way. They're giving you prime yeah. location because their customers are coming to them. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think consignment can be a dirty word, but it doesn't need to be <coughs> if your merchandise sells because most of them uh, pay within 30 days or 45 days after your goods are sold. So if you are successful, then if you turn your goods, then you will get a cash flow. The unfortunate thing is if you don't, you know, I, I know Bergdorf has a great policy. They understand that you can't afford just to keep giving them merchandise. So they said, we want to work with you. So three months later, if you haven't sold a thing, and we, but our sales associates loves you. They will extend it for another three months to give you another chance. And uh, you know, they don't, they say as soon as you sell something, they'll have a check written for you for the, the next month. Uh, I think a lot of them, Neiman's and Sachs, are like that too. Mm -hmm. But uh, and there there are too few uh, of the Mary Helens in the world, the Reinhold people, who just she's just excited to see new design, to discover new designers, and support them. But even if someone bought you, let's say paid twenty thousand, if it doesn't sell, that's it. That you, you got your twenty thousand, there will be no repeat orders. So you're the one who needs to make it happen. That doesn't work. I'm going to give you something else to try. I'm going to come to the store, speak to your salespeople, tell them my story, get them excited. Okay. You have to so. always look at it as a partnership. 
Yes. You're going into business with them just as they're going into business with you. You have to partner them in every way that you can and they should be reciprocal to you. And like Cindy was saying, it, it's a negotiation and you have to do what's going to work for you financially, but it, it has to it has to be for each party involved and, and really look to support them and, and take the chance. They're taking a chance on you and we, you have to just do always the same. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, um, exclusivity, which I want to go back to and talk a little bit more about that, especially one of our questions. Um, sorry. Uh, how does a gallery owner or retailer react knowing his collection has been presented to another store or another stage or to a, another competitor? Can you elaborate a little bit more about exclusivity, what happens with uh, with two different competing retailers, like say Saks and Nina Marcus, et cetera? I think that's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, you should have two retailers fighting and you can choose what stores on your own terms. I don't think there's a problem at all. I think you should show it to everyone that you think, you know, if you walk the floor and you think, I belong here, like what Teresa says, look whether you're in the right company. You say, yeah, I see myself right there. Then you contact that buyer. I think I'm right for your store, you know? I'm going to throw that question to Karen to be a little bit more specific. Um, you want to share your story? Well, I, I haven't had, well, in my current position, um, we are currently at one of the top department stores, and the buyer specifically told me that if he sees our pieces in our competitors, then he'll be very, very upset. And so it's, it's rather difficult because on one hand, as everyone had mentioned about exclusivity, everyone wants what others don't have. Um, but at the same time, we want to grow the business, so it's kind of a fine line, and we don't want to upset our current client, customer, um, and it's, it's, it's been a little bit uh, difficult. Um, trying to please everyone and make everyone happy. And, and yeah. so for, for me, it's, it's just the hardest situation. I have um, two stores that I am extremely close with, in Birmingham, Alabama, and I have very long-term relationships with both of them. Um, it, they are always putting themselves against each other, and and it's a very difficult situation for me because I, I want them to have everything, but I can't do something that's going to make the other store unhappy. And I really had to um, work very closely with them on what their actual commitments are to the designers. And we just, we look at what the designer's price points are, we look at what their collection looks like. Um, if they're going to be supporting that business consistently, we give a number, we look at what they can do, um, we then can give them the exclusivity. But if they can't do it, then we have to let both of them have it. If they're not going to really be behind it, um, it it's it, and Dax and Neiman's will always, um, you know, of course they're not going to ever name the, their competitor, but they will um, certainly let me know that they would rather it not be in the other retailer. But again, we have to look at where their commitment is and how that evolves. So we're, we're constantly um, working very closely with them. And if they can't follow through, then we have to open it up. But it's, it's, it's certainly a very tender, tender subject. And when you're, you're outside of New York, you know, the radius, you know, New York, you, you can be, our store uh, is on um, Prince Street, and we can have another store three blocks away that has a very different customer. But when you're out in these small towns, you can't be at a competitor. It's very hurtful um, to their businesses, and they're very territorial. Um, so it, it's a very, um, you know, it's a tender issue, and that's why going to look at who you really want to be at is important because if you're in store A and then all of a sudden store B comes along, you, you can't do that to you, the, the person that first supported you, even though you wanted to be in B all along. Um, you, you have to you know, make those decisions right from the beginning, if that's possible to do. Go after who you really want. And um, how does all this apply to online retailing as well? Um, they, do you yes. find that the stores have <laughs> challenges with if you're yes, online? We, 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 have, we have two very specific accounts that um, have let us know in, <laughs> know in certain terms that they don't want us to sell to the other 
online retailer. And again, it makes it a very difficult position for us. I mean, the designers all want to have as much business as they can. But again, we have to look at their commitment. We have to look at how they're supporting them, how they're featuring them, and make that determination. And sometimes we have to let both of them have it. They, they, they're, they're both on two different <laughs> sides of the US, but retail online is it doesn't matter that they're <laughs> in two different locations, that they're, they're fighting the same online audience. So again, you have to be very selective, but you have to also just monitor that business and you don't want to hurt any of your retailers. So um, our next category now, we talk about marketing, um, because now you're in the stores, everyone's happy, now we need to generate interest to sell the products. Um, I want to start with the very most basic in, in the retail world, which is trunk shows. Um, should they do should they do trunk shows? What they, can they expect from doing trunk shows? Is that something that retailers required them to do? Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it, you want, even if they don't ask you, you should insist on it. Because it's the only way that, uh, you know, who can speak about your product and your story more than you can. You know, or if you can't, then find someone who can on your behalf. Because uh, customers, especially at the, the luxury end, love to know the story like Victoria mentioned, because there are, there are, there's so much jewelry. What's different about you is very important. So you need to engage customers. And also you need to uh, engage the sales associates. When you're not there, they are your ambassadors. So I would say it's key. That's That's how, you know, you, it's two way, you get to know the store, you get to know the customer, and they get to know you. And don't be disappointed if the first go around you don't sell anything, because it does have a, a ripple effect. The next time you come, they will say, aha, I saw you last season. Now they might be back to buy, because they might not want to spend 10,000 on someone whose brand they don't know, but they, they trust the store that you're in, so the next time they might not hesitate. I think it also gives um, the associates an opportunity to talk to the customer. As soon as they come up to the case, they can perhaps tell them about the last time the designer was there, and they might, it just starts a conversation. And, I, and like you just mentioned, I mean, it's so important. Those salespeople are in the store every single day. You're there maybe once every six months or once a year. So those salespeople should really know you, should really know how <coughs> you know, what you say, what your inspirations are, because they pass it on to the ultimate consumer. So, and it, it's again, it's about partnering with the stores and that provides a great service to them. So I strongly encourage everyone to do trunk shows. I'll take the opposite tack though. Um, for s when you're working with small stores, of course the department store, they naturally have um, traffic. Smaller stores, maybe more hot and cold. So when you are asked to do a trunk show, you want to make sure that the retailer is a partner, that they're doing their job too. They're not just letting you come into their house. They should be doing advertising or promotion. Their sales staff should be on the phone calling their best customers, letting them know there's a trunk show. There have been all too many grim stories where a store has a trunk show and they forgot to do anything about it. So you show up, you fly there, you sleep there, and You've got all this expense, which is part of doing business. I'm not saying it shouldn't be, you shouldn't lay out some money, but there should be a partnership. And I know a lot of designers have contracts. Here, when I come to a trunk show, here's what we each do. Again, something in writing, I'm always a fan of that. And it's, they're going to do a minimum number of phone calls to customers, and they're going to do at least one postcard mailing. If not an ad, maybe you split the cost of an ad. But how are they gonna make sure that people come into the store to see you and that you're not just alone there? And there's even negotiation about how you spend that time. There's one incredibly phenomenal retailer out there who doesn't do anything for lunch and leaves you standing there by yourself in their store to figure out if you're going to eat or not that day. Other retailers are so incredibly warm, they pick you up in the morning, they make sure you have coffee, they order in lunch, make sure you're fed, they make sure you get back to your hotel that night. So the gamut of what they do for you while you do for them is why. So have it all in writing in a, in a very friendly email, what your expectations are and what their promises are too. Mm -hmm. So it should be very cold and angry. Is it important then for our artists to advertise or is uh, using a PR campaign the best way? Which, what would you advise? 
in terms of their own promotions and preparing? I mean, that's it's such a wide question. It just really depends on what your what your budget is like. I mean, some things are so you know expensive. A page in a magazine can cost as much as going to a trade show. You know, so it's it really depends. I, I would say, um, you know, PR can be just as important as as taking out ad because at first most people can't afford ads in the magazines that really give you the most bang for your buck. They in style where people call in and buy straight from the ads. Um, but, you know, so I would say understanding um, the, the PR side of it, understanding what editors were looking for, um, which I can talk about very quickly but between consumer and trade. I mean, trade editors, if you're approaching a JCK magazine or another trade publication, you want to make sure you have great photographs because they come. Excellent photographs, very, very on important. white backgrounds. On white backgrounds, high resolution, fit for print, uh, over 300 DPI, you know, big image that you can get to them immediately of your newest pieces. It's it, that's a huge place where you should spend your money. Um, no trade publication is going to shoot your jewelry unless it's being worn on someone. Um, otherwise, they're going to look for your images. Have that stuff ready to go because sometimes these are very quick deadlines. You want to have a headshot, you want to have a, a short bio, and you want to have the pieces with captions and uh, you know retail pricing um, and where it's available. Um, that can get you you know that can get you seen by the right retailer who can then put you in their store. Um, if you're working with a consumer publication, understand that's going to be a very long lead usually. Um, they're going to want to know what's coming down the pipeline three months from now. Um, and if they do want to shoot your jewelry, make sure you are prepared to ship it to them, make sure you have your insurance set up, make sure you have all of these kind of pieces ready because if you're going to approach an editor and they're going to take their time to respond to you or ask for you and then you can't deliver on that, they probably won't come to you the next time. Um, so you just want to be prepared if you are going to reach out to someone to, to make sure that you have everything ready that So um, I'll pass this up to Victoria. Um, how do editors select when I'm still a feature? And I'm going to ask you from two yeah, perspectives because you write for New York Times and you have the JCK. Um, what I've found as an editor, and I've been a writer for many years, but now I'm editing, is that I have a very specific idea of what each issue is about. So I know more or less what I'm looking for, and we have an editorial calendar, which I'd be happy to share with you know anyone who emails me. Um, in terms of pieces, I mean, again, I can't stress enough what Randy just said, high resolution on a white background, not on models, not on in nature settings, but, you know, something that we can easily take and put on a page and it doesn't look strange with all the other pieces on that page. Um, we're looking for often, you know, we're covering a range of jewelry, so if it fits in a theme. Um, we're closing our big June issue, which is the biggest Issues, issue of the year this week for, for us because it goes to the JCK show in Vegas. And one of our themes is uh, pieces with darker blue stones like a lapis lazuli or a darker blue sapphire. So if you happen to email us when we're putting that together, it, you know, it's a great way to, to land. I mean, some of that is just serendipity that you're gonna contact us as we're looking for something like that. Um, Otherwise, you know, our editorial calendar, we, we do an issue that's around silver jewelry, we do an issue around gold jewelry. So sometimes just by knowing when we're targeting a specific type of jewelry, it'll be, you know, something that we can consider. And a lot of it is just how, how pieces look on the page. And you've probably found this, and if you haven't, there's an editorial mindset and there's a buyer mindset. Retailers what looks good on a page and what attracts an editor or something is that it's new, it's different, it complements the other piece as well. It's not always the same thing that is gonna to appeal to a buyer because the buyer has to say, well, this is something that a customer might wear. Um, wearability and kind of editorial pizzazz are two different things. And so to appeal to both with one piece is a little challenging, but sometimes if something's editorially strong and gets the editor's notice, It'll appeal to someone looking at the magazine. They may not be able to sell that exact piece, but they'll at least know you, know your name, think about you as somebody with a strong design aesthetic that they'll want to come back to. Um, so sometimes, and I do think 
just going back to a little bit the, the question of advertising versus PR and editorial, I mean, an ad is a lot of money, as Randy said, but an editor, you know, if you get a stamp of approval, I mean, that's a third party saying to customers out there, I think this is worthwhile, I think this is different, I think this is original. And for me, as a, just a consumer and as a person who's, uh, you know, looking through my own magazine and seeing what I'm gonna buy, I always appreciate an editor's point of view more than an advertiser, because I know the advertising was paid for versus the editorial, which was chosen and selected. So, you know, and as a smaller designer, I would put my faith in sort of PR, getting in touch with editors, hosting, um, you know, maybe, I mean, these kinds of events where you collectively come together and there's a cocktail reception and various editors can come your way. I think, you know, these kinds of ways of putting your money are, are gonna be more effective until you get to that stage where you can spend, a, you know, 100 grand on a big, intense ad campaign. But at, at the sort of more unique designer level, I think targeting editors um, who, you know, who, I think people pay attention to editorial. I mean, especially magazines like an InStyle or a W where, like Randy said, they'll call right off that page and say, where can I buy this? Um, I think, was it, Teresa, you were making a point that, or someone was making a point about um, a buyer in St. Louis calling. Yeah, Rob Report. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. sorry. One of my clients. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> But that doesn't so, always happen. No. I hate to think, you know, I have a lot of people who get a great placement and then they worry, I didn't get a single call, it failed. And it's not a failure. The exposure is valuable. And it strips in a bucket, fill your bucket. It's very rare, and maybe once in your career where you're gonna get a gusher, where something you did, and you don't know what it is, it's a trade show, it's a PR opportunity, just overwhelms your business and you get that great response, usually it's just a consistent drips in your bucket. Mm -hmm. Can you tell them how you like getting email, um, yeah, yeah. content? I'll, I'll tell you my favorite way to get an email, um, or to be contacted, it's definitely not on the phone. Um, it's an email, and the email is brief, and it, it says, you know, the subject line is new designer for consideration, or, you know, Quebec based jeweler with a new collection. Um, it has a brief bio, a brief introduction, not high re not high res images all at attached so my inbox explodes with it um, but you know a PDF where I can clearly see the images awesome is if they're embedded in the email and I can actually see them without even clicking onto an attachment because sometimes I mean you know you get 200 emails a day you're just trying to scroll down see what it is and there are three to five pieces that represent your range. So, you know, they're different pieces, they've got brief descriptions, you know exactly what you're looking at, what it costs at retail. And um, and it's simple. And and then, you know, you may not hear back because it depends. If it comes in on a day that I'm traveling and it gets buried, then a month later you send a really nice email saying, I'm sure you're busy, but I just wanted to say hi again. And again, you know, I think Amelia was saying this Do the too. same thing for the buyers, exactly mm -hmm. what she did. Exactly, exactly. Yes. when she was saying it, I thought that's exactly the same approach. Mm -hmm. The squeaky wheel does get, the squeaky wheel, what's the phrase? Gets the, gets the wheel, gets, gets the oil. The squeaky the oil. wheel gets the oil. <laughs> um, but in a respectful way, you know, the same yes. thing with buyers and editors. If you haven't heard back, feel free to come back again. Be gracious, be diplomatic, be to the point. Um, and eventually, if someone's contacted me three times, I feel very bad that I haven't responded, so I will. <laughs> you know? So it works, but you know, not, not three times in one week. So. In our office, we call it the velvet hammer technique. Yeah. One, you know, as, as soft and lovely and fuzzy as you can be, but keep hammering away. It's a great way of putting it. I mean, you know, once a month, once every three weeks. Um, yeah. And I would say just another quick tip, if you can reach out to, there's you know a lot of industry organizations that can kind of help you with your PR on your behalf. Some you might have to become a member of, but it's not usually huge fees. Um, people like AGTA, um, there's the World Gold Council, there's the Platinum Guild. They're always looking for new and exciting jewelry designers that they can show to the marketplace because they're having meetings with editors saying, look at all this yeah. cool platinum jewelry, mm -hmm. can't you feature this? And if you have great platinum jewelry, they're going to want you in their kind of stable of designers that they're able to um, to show, to send pictures of, to have the representative events. And again, some of these people might have small fees, but it's much less of a fee than if you're getting a whole PR company to 
put on retainer just for you. So there's a lot of those organizations out there that are worthwhile um, to look up. I mean, I just came from the Platinum Guild had an editor's day, I mean, literally just before here, and it was, you know, a few dozen designers all in different categories, different prices. I mean, it's a great way to reach, you know, dozens of editors without having to be there, without having somebody else do all that legwork. So that's a great point. Yeah. I think the Wogo Council and then what was De Beers Forever Mark, they're always looking for young talent because they don't want, they want to be cool as well. Mm -hmm. So they, they I, I get lots of phone calls from them to say, who's the next person we should be collaborating with? And it's good for you because they, they will help you market and they're going to give you, I mean, Forever Mark will actually give you diamonds to work with uh, on your pieces and then they get to market it on your behalf. So that's a great point, Randy. Yeah, the Silver Promotion, World Gold Council, all great organizations. I'm going to have one more question, then we'll open up to the panel. Um, and um, I'm going to direct this to Cindy and Meeling, and if anybody else wants to fill in, it'll be great. Uh, apart from ourselves, who should be on our team or professionals to promote our business? Are there any benefits to hiring a counselor, or guide, or advisor, or master guru? And what can you expect to get from them um, if you do it, bring in an advisor or counselor to help you in your building your business? I know, many questions in one. <laughs> okay. Um, interesting, yesterday I, I evaluated a, a contract that one of my clients was given by a marketing firm. And it was really easy for me and less easy for her to decipher it because she had met them. And she was wowed by how, how dynamic the women were. And when we looked at what the proposal was, they were kind of offering sales, marketing, PR, trunk shows, celebrity placement, and, a, and a, a, really a host of things. Can we stop first and ask if you need all those things before you get pitched that kind of help? So I guess the first advice is make sure that, that if you're looking to hire someone, they are the round peg to your round hole. Um, you want to make sure that they've worked with other people in the jewelry industry. I hate when you pay someone to learn your industry. If they're great at fashion PR, leave them in the fashion world. And it's just, that's really my prejudice. Um, because they need to get quickly to understand your world and you really don't want to teach them your world. Unless they're free or really, really cheap, and then you can. But if they're an expert, you want to make sure that they have the connections that they say they have, they've worked with people like you, you want to make sure you, that they're a personal fit with you, that you like them, because they're going to be climbing up your grill. You're going to be working with them all the time, and you want to be happy about that. And you want to make sure that your agreements are specific and here's and, and start small, so that you're not getting from the kitchen sink from a consultant. Make sure that you know what it is they can produce. You're not enamored by successes outside your industry, and that you have measurable results that you both can keep track of and make sure you like them. Those are my advice for outsiders. I've had my own consulting firm for the last six years. Or you could just hire her. Right. <laughs> Everything I just said, just go straight to me. Like, don't think it through. Cindy's paid to say that. Yeah. Um, and I like to tell uh, people who come to me that I am not uh, the doorman. I don't open the door to Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus, and Sachs because that's really not what I do. And I think with any consultant that you work with or any help you bring in, is, it's not you need to know who you are, where you want to go first. You really need to know yourself and then communicate and find the best person, you know. So someone, if, if you want to be in Barney's, you know, then look for that person that fits your DNA. If you want to be in a Macy's, then it's a completely different world that you're playing in. But work with someone to develop your line so that you're ready when, you, when the door to Bergdorf, Neiman's, Macy's is open because you don't really get a lot of chances, remember, so you have to be ready. Think of finding a school for your children or something. It, you know, it, this is very dear to you. So plan for, in order to plan for success, you know, you, not one person is going to answer all your questions, is what Cindy's saying. They, uh, and, and don't, if, you, if you're small and starting out, don't spend all your money on PR and advertising, because you're, you are the one who's going to make it happen, or, or find a business partner who can, you know, help you figure it out. So if you're not the kind who wants to be on the floor selling it, 
uh, which everybody prefers because even even if you're shy, people understand that, but they, they want to know it's authentic, that you designed this particular piece, you can talk about this piece, where the diamonds came from, or why is the piece designed this way. But uh, when something looks, when the proposal looks too good to be true, it usually is. You know, just, uh, and, and don't, don't try to do five things from on day one. Do one or two things, have very, very realistic goals. And, uh, and I think editorially, like Victoria and Randy says, they like to hear from you yourself. And in the beginning, they understand that you're young and you're new, you know, you don't have a powerhouse PR company working on your behalf. And I think you, you guys appreciate that, right? You like that. You so it's a discovery for them too. They're looking for someone to write a great story about. You know, someone, they, they're from Quebec and, you know, guess yeah. what? They use, you know, 99.9% silver, you know, or something, a great story to tell. Yes. One addendum is that, and I think we're all used to this now, but timeliness is key. Like if an editor or a buyer for that matter, anybody emails you or contacts you, unless you're on the other side of the world and you don't get that message for a day, I mean, you really need to respond right away. It's it's the demand, we just expect that these days because everybody's and got a phone. Everybody has a phone sitting here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, in her hand. Yeah. And be ready to support. So to be true. Yeah, be ready yeah. to support your business. Yeah. Because once you're in there and you have no customer service, you can't repair and all that. Again, you want it to be a positive experience once you land in a case. Yeah. yeah. So be very careful what you ask for sometimes. <laughs> okay. I I have a little bit of time for a few questions. Do is there any questions from the artists? Has everything been covered? Let me try. Or we scared you too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, who's that? Well, I was just, I'm so happy because uh, pretty much everybody covered what I had intended uh, to listen from you guys. And thank you because I know you reach personally through experiences and it, uh, it really looked uh, quite down to earth and sincere. So that is much I can say. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Last question for all of you. What is the one bit of advice that each of you would give all these artists um, in their time here, in their career, wherever you want to go in this? We're going to work this way, starting with the link. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then Teresa, be ready. <laughs> yeah. I, I always ask three questions. N know who you are and where you are now. And then find out where you really want to go, or who you want to be. And then third would be, you know, how you how do you get there? If you can answer, is like homework for all my my clients. Actually, I send them home. I say, okay, this is what you do the first session. They say, that's it. Go home and do that homework. It's not always easy. So you really need to know who you are, and where you are today, and then where you want to go, who do you want to be, and then. The third one will be the execution. How are we going to get that? And we have, then you see, I have to bring in this person, PR, and all that. Well, I think she covered a lot right yeah. there. <laughs> <No. laughs> but but um, I'll just go back to a few different points. Um, again, know your identity, know who you are. Um, I, I always think that's the most important. Know that that's something that you want to continue with because that's going to really show. Um, first and foremost to everyone really believe in what you you do don't feel embarrassed to call anyone they um, They should be welcoming and this industry. I think is really warm and very friendly and talk to everyone get as much information as you can from um, your your fellow designers. I mean, learn as much as you can. It's it's just critical. I would also say just have the basics when you first start. Make sure that your collection is well developed. Have some high res images. Again, as we spoke about with the white white background, um, just have them ready because you never know when things are going to happen. And have a very um, um, cohesive line book just to have it you it really should look like the jewelry it doesn't have to be a hundred percent perfect but just have it very clear and very straightforward and very understandable you can start with those basics and go anywhere from there well 
I agree to what uh, Teresa and Mimi uh, had said. In addition, I would say that believe in your work, believe in yourself, and never give up, and be persistent. That's, that's my advice. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, all of this. I'd say definitely do your homework. Make sure if you're targeting buyers, retailers, you know what else they carry. You know that it's similar, but ever so slightly different, so it complements the other things they carry. I mean, don't go approaching a Macy's if your work is more suited to Barney's, and you know, I mean, this is a bit obvious, but I think enough people hear a name and think, oh, I need to be in that store, when it's really not the right place. Um, and then just to uh, reinforce, just don't be discouraged. I think you have to keep coming back to people in a gentle, velvet hammer kind of way, because we're all busy, everybody gets a million emails or contacts, and so just don't be discouraged if at first it doesn't penetrate. Yeah. That tips into my key. Um, take nothing personally. Mm -hmm. Nothing. The buyer who didn't return your call doesn't hate you, they were busy. The editor who didn't stop by on the way of the trade show probably was going to the bathroom at the end of your aisle. Think, give everyone the benefit of the doubt, and Take nothing personally except your commitment to your own success. And secondly, train yourself to be an extrovert if you're not one, or hire one, or marry one. <laughs> <laughs> Introverts do not get far in their own businesses if they're the, you have to be the face of your business, so you want to train yourself to be an extrovert. Um, I would also say definitely that. And the, the jewelry industry is, is, as many of us as they are, we all know each other. It's a small industry. Um, it's a, yeah, it's, you, you want to be nice to everyone. It is intimate. People talk about who the next big thing is. I will bump into an editor at a trade show and say, who should I go see? They will tell me. It's, it's, everyone is very open, friendly. We all are at the same events and know each other. So realize that and treat everyone accordingly because they will you know, mention your name in a good way or hopefully not a bad way, but <laughs> it could come out that way. Uh, so that, I would say, is, is really important. And just... Um, the one other thing I have to say is if you if you are really not a good business person and you have the ability to partner with someone who is a good business person, I cannot tell you how strongly I recommend that. I can't tell you how many brilliant jewelry designers I know whose businesses ultimately failed because they were not willing to give up some of the control to someone who really knows the business end of the industry well. If you have if you're not good at that and you think you kind of know everything and this is my jewelry and I'm going to do what I want with it, I've, it's, I've broken my heart um, seeing some people who have extraordinary jewelry who couldn't make it happen. Um, so if that's not your forte, if you can find someone with whom to partner with, um, it, could, it could absolutely change your business for the positive. So that's it. So with that, I say thank you very much to the panel. Um, we will break for lunch, but before we go, we do have something special for our panel members. So give me one second when we grab it. Uh, but say thank you if you want to give them a round of applause.